Yo, what's up? Welcome to the Marin Lazic Pod, where we essentially get stoked on wellness, health, and training. Um, today's pod is brought to you by TRX Training Sydney. Uh, we are doing online classes, so make sure that you go on the trxtrainingsydney.com or you can go on this website, marinlazic.coach. Hit me up and we can talk training. Uh, training on TRX, we can talk about kettlebells, we can go talk about health coaching or whatever. But make sure you check it out and hit me up. Now, today, uh, excited about this one because it's uh, a friend, uh, Marcus Hamill, who is actually a meditation teacher. Now, um, Marcus and I have worked on a couple of sporting training camps with a water polo teams where uh, my role was a strength conditioning coach and Marcus was in charge of recovery, meditation and yoga. So it was a really nice balance um, and I learned a lot uh, from working alongside Marcus. Uh, what I love about Marcus and his meditation teacher teaching is not just that um, it's about meditation and spiritual stuff, but there's a lot of science uh, behind it. Uh, Marcus himself does geek out on science side of meditation uh, so today was a really good chat um, honestly I can talk to Marcus for hours about all sorts of stuff and every time I have you know I caught up in Marcus whether it's in a camp or in the surf we just talk for hours about all sorts of stuff and I always come come away feeling so much more positive so much better and so much more educated so fully stoked to our share Marcus with you guys and uh, learn all things uh, meditation. So we talk about meditation, his journey on becoming a meditation teacher, which is cool. Uh, we talk about benefits of meditation. Uh, we talk about breath work. So it was a cool little chat. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you do, please uh, uh, hit up some stars, five stars only. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Marcus Hamill, welcome to the pod. How are you going? I'm very well. Thanks, Marin. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, we'll get into it. For my audience that doesn't know who you are, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm a meditation and yoga teacher. Actually been doing that for the last uh, six or seven years. Prior to that, I was a director in the film industry for a long time. Yeah, cool. And um, what inspired you to kind of get into the um, meditation firstly and then teaching? Yeah, so well, I came to meditation around about a decade ago. Uh, like a lot of people do through crisis, actually through a bit of a personal crisis. It doesn't always need to be like that, mind you, but it's certainly, I was a slow learner, so I, I had to wait till I was in crisis to <laughs> come and make the change. I was working as a director in the commercial space. I, I wouldn't have even self-reported as being stressed if you had of asking at the time but evidently I was because eventually I had a massive anxiety attack and you know I don't, what led to that was I guess just a whole series of li minor lifestyle choices that end up being your life you know the way, the way I was eating drinking too much going out too much working hard the stress of being a freelance director you know super busy when you're busy making a lot of money and then you know, stressed out about not getting work when you don't have work. And I had a young family as well. I had a couple of young daughters at the time as well. And still have young daughters, but they're just not so young. Um, and, yeah, and I, uh, one night, um, funny enough, just after my 40th birthday, so I guess you could call it a midlife crisis as well, although I don't think I was actually thinking about it like that at the time. I just My nervous system just literally tipped over the edge. And so it was probably two nights after my 40th birthday, and I, I remember it very distinctly. It was just, you know, a normal normal night going to bed Monday night. And just as I was falling asleep, I woke up just in total anxiety. I didn't know it was anxiety at the time. I didn't know what a panic attack looked like. But I literally felt like someone had shoved a uh, needle of adrenaline into my heart. All my, boss, all my body was 
cramped up. I couldn't breathe. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And, you know, in the morning, it lasted most of the night, and in the morning I kind of did a little bit of um, Dr. Google, got online, and, and I realized that I'd had a panic attack. And that was kind of the start of my journey, I guess, because from there, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it feels like it was around about two weeks or so where I was really tinkering on the edge where I wasn't actually worried about anything except for having a panic attack. I wasn't having anxiety over anything in particular, but I was worried about having another anxiety attack. And that kind of feedback loop of anxiety was very much alive in my nervous system and my consciousness. And I couldn't talk about it. You know, my, my wife, Cass, would ask me if I was okay and I couldn't really even talk about it because talking about it would trigger it. So I was very much stuck in this dark space for a couple of weeks. And as, I guess, grace would have it, um, a very old friend of mine, Gary Goro, moved back to Avalon and I hadn't seen him in around about a decade, I guess, something like that. And I ran into him and he just looked like a completely different person. I just couldn't fathom how radiant he was. He was just, he looked so healthy. He looked so calm. He looked so present. And I just, this massive change had happened in him and it made me inquire. And I started asking him questions and I discovered that he, you know, in the process of the you know decade or so since I'd seen him, he'd moved out of the film industry and out of fashion and he trained to become a meditation teacher and he'd been meditating for I guess some time prior to that and that was it that was the start of my journey as soon as I saw him I was like I need to find out how to do this I booked into a introductory talk that he did on a Monday night and by the Tuesday night I was meditating and what um when you if I'm not sure you remember but when you googled uh, or what did you go? Did you Google anxiety? Did you Google stress? Like, what did you actually Google that? Uh, I think I actually just Googled the symptoms. I don't because yeah. I didn't. I didn't really know what it was. I kind of knew that I was having some sort of mental breakdown, but I didn't. I mean, I guess I must have had an inkling that it was ang- an anxiety attack, but I didn't really know what that looked like because anxiety attacks I've since come to discover from working with a lot of people with anxiety is they they can present really differently. So for me. Um, what was quite because one of the symptoms of an anxiety attack once you go into that state quite often people will feel a very dissociative um, sensation where where their mind or their consciousness feels disconnected from their body but that actually happened to me prior to my anxiety attack that's what actually triggered my anxiety attack i started feeling like my consciousness somehow disconnected from my body and i felt very out of body and that triggered the anxiety so i kind of had it had it the other way around Mm. Um, so it wasn't so obvious to me what was going on. So I think I just Googled all of those things and then it became pretty clear to me. I think Cass was also saying to me it's just an anxiety attack. And um, it's just hard to kind of fathom that when you don't think of yourself as being stressed. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I reckon well, yeah, a lot of people will be probably feeling this right now. Um, out, of, out of curiosity as well, when you Googled that, did meditation come up on Google or? I don't think so. Yeah. I don't remember that. I don't. I certainly don't. It wasn't part of my way to that path. I didn't, um, you know, I feel like I was just really lucky or really graced to find that path because, I mean, the reality is if I had gone to a doctor, then there's a very good chance they would have sent me to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and then there's a very good chance they would have told me to medicate. Yeah. And I don't think I would have done that, but a lot of people do. And really, you know, from my point of view, what I've come to discover through the practices is that for the most part, anxiety, depression, insomnia, all these things are really symptomatic of a mind-body system that's out of balance. So getting to the core of what's going on and balancing that is your foundation, you know, not masking it initially with, with drugs. And how, so you started meditating, how long? Do you think it took you to feel better? Like as in how how long, how many hours or sessions or I mean how often did you do it? Yeah, so as I said, I went to this little talk on a Monday night where Gary described all the benefits of meditation and how the particular practice that I ended up learning, Vedic meditation, how how it worked, what it was about, the tradition that it came from. Um you know, how the course was structured, all that stuff. And the whole time that he was talking, 
I was just thinking, shut up and teach me. Because <laughs> I just, I already had decided, I'd already decided by looking at him that there was something in this. It, it just, he didn't need to convince me. Um, but so anyway, the course started the following evening, Tuesday, Tuesday evening in Avalon, 30 p.m. It went for 90 minutes, four nights in a row, four 90 minute sessions. I remember the first session I was initiated into the practice and that was done one on one, and then we were in a small group. There was about six of us, and Kath actually joined the same course. So I left. Gary taught me, gave me my mantra. And the word mantra means mind vehicle in Sanskrit, so it's a little kind of it's a sound, no intentional meaning, just a, a kind of vibrational sound that has the quality of calming the mind. He taught me that, um, taught me some simple instruction on how to do it, and I dropped in. I really dropped in that first session. Yeah. Experience like that. I actually, for the first time, I guess I was experiencing myself before the mind, knowing myself as something other than my thoughts. Very profoundly powerful experience. And I walked out of there, and I remember Kath was coming to do the session after me. And I walked out of Gary's studio, and you've got to remember, I was coming from a state of heightened stress and anxiety, and I was feeling really out of thoughts. And I walked out of there, and I felt very calm. I was looking around. It was a beautiful afternoon and it was in summer, so daylight savings, there was still plenty of daylight after I finished and everything just looked different. I felt like, I actually honestly felt like someone had wiped a foggy windscreen clear and I was looking out of it for the first time with, with clear vision. This was one session and I remember Kath saying to me, how was it? And I just looked at her and smiled and I said, I, I don't even want to say anything, you just go and do it. And we didn't talk about it till she got home that night. Um, I wouldn't say that all of my problems were over from that session, but I knew very clearly that I'd found the thing that was going to heal me of this. I was really fortunate as well um, that I hadn't, I wasn't in that cycle for long. You know, it was two weeks, three weeks. I, I, you know, I don't want to make it sound like someone can heal anxiety in one session. You know, I've worked with many, many different people with anxiety in different people, and it depends how long they've been in that cycle for how deep those grooves are worn into their, their mind and their body, how how much of that is, you know, really in their bio memory. But for me, it had been a very short time and so it shifted really quickly. I think part of that was just the idea, the deep knowing that it didn't even matter if I had another anxiety attack. If it happened, I had a tool to deal with it and so I lost quite, it really severed the fear of having it, which, which stopped the feedback loop. So kind of straight away for me, but that's not the case for everyone. Um, having such a, um, um, I guess, huge experience and how you felt, um, did that kind of also then motivate you to become a teacher because you want to share it? Like what what, what, what made you decide to go, you know what, I'm going to step away from a you know, st- high stressful, well-paid corporate job and become a teacher? Yeah, so... Straight away, I got into the practice really deeply, which was easy for me. Um, you know, twice a day, 20 minutes twice a day, non-negotiable, just did it every day. One, because I'm, I think I'm just like that. I can be motivated if I know that something's good for me, but also because there was just no way I was going to go back into that other state. And then, you know, to be honest, it wasn't even... Strangely, it wasn't the fact that I was feeling better so quickly that made me want to be a teacher. I just had this... I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but it was probably, I think it was the second night of the course. I just knew I was going to do it. It was very weird. I sat in the course listening to Gary and it just, I just knew I was going to do it one day. Although my mentally, that was my intuition. Mentally, I was sitting there thinking, you know, there's no way you're going to do this. You'd have to go and live in India. And how would you, like Gary felt so far away from me at that time. You know, his knowledge and experience and everything just seemed so unattainable, but there was just something deep in me that felt like this was my purpose, this was what I was meant to be doing. And then that really just anchored in over time as I studied more and more and I went deeper into the practice and I started realising that, you know, that it was actually, it became, you know, my, I guess one of my deepest interests as, you know, from very early on. So um, I know uh, you actually committed to it, you know, fully and, one of the things I really respect about you, Marcus, is that you didn't do a six-week TAFE course and all of a sudden became a guru. Uh, I know that you were sourced out a teacher and, and you did your time and hours. So I guess, can you 
share what you did and what was that the journey to becoming a guru i know you don't like becoming called guru but yeah so the journey to becoming a teacher was a long one really i mean it started obviously as a student and then as i got deeper into meditation i became interested in the wisdom behind it behind the technique um i became really kind of deeply interested in yoga vedantic wisdom um you know the whole body of wisdom that supports yoga as well not yoga like we know it like you know stretchy pants who can tie themselves in not yoga but yoga the the wisdom of, of unity um i started studying advanced courses um through gary and through tom noll i started going on a lot of retreats and then eventually i started looking into the prerequisites for teacher training at that stage it still seemed kind of unattainable because gary was mostly running them in india three month programs in india and i had a young family it just wasn't happening and then i spoke to gary about it one day and it didn't seem like he was going to do anything different and then probably a month later he sent me an email saying he was actually going to run an integrated program in avalon in my hometown so it was kind of amazing and it was it was every friday for 18 months we would get together for a full day plus a whole um very deep kind of home personal practice and then a number of retreats over that time and once i knew it was happening like that i was in um i didn't know how it was going to work for me because i was working freelance as a director and i was kind of thinking you know i'm going to miss a lot of days but the whole 18 months i don't think i missed a session the directing just kind of somehow organized itself around the teacher training and i managed to fit it all in and it was kind of a perfect it was a perfect training ground for for what kind was to come as well because i didn't quit directing i kept directing afterwards and so I, i kind of learned over that year how to integrate this practice and the training and everything into my my other life my family life my directing life which is interesting because ultimately this is what meditation is about right like we're not interested in training people to drop out of life it's really about creating this platform that supports you in life that really you know awakens your deeper capacity to function at your highest in every aspect of your life you know we're not interested in just meditating and dropping out So um, integrated training kind of provided I think a really good platform for that. And so you end up going to India after that after the 18 months or Yeah, so I started teaching part-time um for a couple of years I was still directing um which was really uh, you know I was never I, I didn't want to just drop everything and go out and try and teach and put a lot of pressure on myself financially and I don't think there's much, you know, there's nothing probably more unattractive than a stressed out meditation teacher. <laughs> so financial, I didn't want to kind of bring financial stress into my life. Um, I realized when I graduated, and I'm sure you're the same, you know, that that the journey of being a teacher, um, you're only ever a teacher, I think, in so far as you're willing to still be a student. And so, and the process is still going for me. I, I don't stop studying. I haven't stopped studying. I've been teaching for six or seven years um and i've been to india a number of times so i started studying with the teacher anand marotra in india and we that's satya yoga satya yoga is a really kind of deep integrated practice of yoga which with meditation as the foundation but then it's you know every aspect of yoga asana the body stuff a lot of breath work a lot of kriya which is the yoga of electricity and energy it's a very holistic integrated practice so that's where i've really been kind of diving deep into in the last three years three or four years what was it like living in india it was incredible but it probably wasn't you know living in india could look like anything <laughs> infinite possibilities living in india depends on where you are and what you're doing we were i wouldn't we were just studying it was such a, i mean we're there for a month uh, a month at a time been there twice for a month at a time and it's just six days a week um long hours you know pre-dawn to sometimes late at night six days a week half a day off um yeah and diving deep practice and study food i'm curious about food was it plant based was it meat what well, what sort of stuff did you eat uh, so i was in rishikesh um rishikesh as it we were we're out of rishikesh um where the, where we're studying but rishikesh as, as a town is entirely vegetarian kind of amazing um no alcohol either which took me a while to realize you just 
kind of sitting around in cafes and restaurants and thinking like something's just a little bit different in this town and then you realize there's no one drinking anywhere. Um, I don't even know if it's, I don't think it's the law, it's just the town, just the way they operate. Um, the food at supper is pretty simple. A um, lot of lot of kind of um, kitcheries and curries and lentils and vegetables and um, just plant-based stuff. Um, good food, really good. I mean, in town, the food's exceptional, you know, it's all sorts of Indian curries and yeah, the reason why I ask that question is obviously, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I want to talk about benefits for meditation, but part of it's also to de-stress your body. Um, and if you are eating bad food or drinking, eating sugar and stuff, that's going to just add to the stress. And I was just curious, like I guess in the town that seems to be known for meditation and yoga, they seem to, whether by choice or I'm not sure why, but they seem to kind of, take away all stuff that will potentially put extra stress on your on your body? Yeah, that's an interesting question because what I love about yoga, the yoga Vedantic system, which you know, meditation is a foundation based of, is there's no rules. It's not like a religion. It's not a, there's no, it's not a dictatorship. It's actually just a system of expanding consciousness and expanding awareness. Now, what happens, I think, over time is things that are no good for you naturally fall away. This is very different to that kind of Western idea, I think, of, of like forcing things on ourselves where we're like, okay, you know, I don't drink alcohol anymore. You know, you've been drinking alcohol every night and it's like suddenly I don't drink. I'm going to fast for, for February. Um, go for a whole month and then you get to the end of the month and the first thing you do is drink again. Or, you know, I, I'm going to eat total plant-based food for a month and I'm going to fast, you know, I'm not going to eat breakfast and, I'll do all this fasting. We, we tend to be quite extreme, I think. Um, yeah, I guess this is a bit of a, a broad stroke, but I think a lot of the, the mentality of how we approach our wellness can be quite extreme. I think with yoga, it's always the middle path, always the middle ground. What you find is over time, as your consciousness expands, you just tend to let go of things that no longer serve you. So for me, I never tried to stop drinking alcohol. I just stopped drinking it. Mm. Um same as coffee for the first few years, although I've got a coffee next to me now. I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, things just fell away naturally. And then when that happens, it just becomes your life rather than something that you're forcing upon your life. It just becomes your life. Um, eating well became a natural expression of feeling good. I, I would say that consciousness is primary. The mind is is the foundation of everything. Our whole experience of life is literally filtered through our state of mind, through our state of consciousness. And so when we deal with the state of consciousness first, then naturally things start to flow from that. Eating well starts to flow from that. Wanting to exercise starts to flow from that. Um, you know, possibly letting go of drinking and other habits that don't serve you anymore. And then when it happens naturally, you're not repressing it. You know, when we tend, when we repress things, it tends to come out in other ways. That's a really good point because I guess um, a lot of people being stuck at home or working from home have gone to the extremes. I know in my sort of community, I see on social media people wanting to run 10 k's a day, which they never used to run full stop. Um, or, you know, go on these crazy fasts because they're not eating so well because they're stuck at home. So I think you make some pretty good points. Um, on that, Marcus, um, I guess we touched on a few points of benefits of meditation but how would you i mean we spoke about anxiety um you know potentially helping with depression what else would you say the meditation is good for well just spinning off what you just said you know this um i'll come to that answer but i just want to kind of touch on what you just were saying before so because i'm seeing this across the board as well that as we've been in this kind of semi well it's not really a lockdown but iso situation that people are, in a lot of cases, going to a lot of extremes and really trying to fill every gap of time. It's like suddenly we're, you know, making sourdough bread and we're, we're making kombucha and we're exercising and we're doing it. It's just kind of non-stop. And I think this is the, the tendency of the human mind and this is what's got us in this situation in the first place is we just, I don't mean specifically the virus, but the situation we're in in society at the moment is that we most of us are so uncomfortable being with ourselves just being present with ourselves and in in a time where there's actually an incredible opportunity to slow down 
to be present, to connect with, you know, the people you live with, your family, your kids, whatever situation you're in, or and fundamentally to connect with yourself, to stop and to realign and to think about where I'm headed in life. Many people just seem to have, you know, in the guise of wellness, seem to have just covered up that opportunity by remaining busy. Mm. You know, uh, making, going to town, making healthy food, doing exercise, reading self-help books. It's like, it's all good. But again, coming back to what I was saying before, the, the middle path, you know, when we, when we fill up every second, we're actually missing an opportunity to be present, to be with ourselves and to actually potentially get some deeper wisdom and intuition in, into what we want from life, what our purpose is, what we're here for. And we're just hiding hiding behind all of this busyness, you know, the, just the busyness of being busy. And so I would say one of the great benefits of meditation is it allows you the capacity to be with yourself comfortably. Um, not always comfortably at, the, at first. You know, sometimes when people learn to meditate, it's really uncomfortable being with themselves. But over time, we start to become more present, more able to be in silence, not be distracted. You know, when we're standing in a, in a line to get a coffee, we're not having to go to our phone and check Instagram to distract ourselves. We're able to be with the isness of isness, to be present to life. This is mindfulness, right? That the, the big kind of buzzword in this, in this kind of meditation space, mindfulness, you know, what is mindfulness? Mindfulness I would describe as present moment, non-judgmental awareness, the ability to sit with the present as it is. And meditation really is a prerequisite for that. You can't be mindful without a practice that allows you to transcend the mind. So basically meditation, I would define meditation as being, at least from my point of view, um, a transcendent practice, a practice that allows you to dive beyond the surface level of the mind into the intrinsically quietest parts of the mind essentially allowing you to meet yourself before the mind or beyond the mind to know yourself as your true self not not just so I, i'll let me let me backtrack a little bit so you can think of your mind being like an ocean so the surface level of the ocean we know you know any wind blows you like the mind the surface level of the mind one thought leads to another leads to another before you know it, it can be totally catastrophizing about something that's never even going to happen you know just projecting into the future when we dive beyond the surface in the ocean we know that it becomes quieter and quieter and quieter. This is the nature of the mind. So when we're meditating with a proper technique, what we're doing is we're actually, we're not even trying to create stillness, we're accessing the stillness that's already there buried beneath the noise. And when we access that state, we're realizing ourselves as consciousness, not as the events in consciousness. So you can think of yourself as consciousness and your thoughts as being events in consciousness. When we sit in that space of deep silence, deep presence, deep stillness, and we come back into the busy life, over time that stillness main, starts to maintain, it starts to permeate every aspect of your life. And so it really builds the capacity to be with the present. One of the biggest um, you know, reasons why you would meditate and, and one of the major benefits of meditating is present moment awareness. The reason being, if you're not present, where are you? Life actually only exists in the present moment. It's a, it's a cliche, but it's totally true, right? If we're, if we're drifting off, worrying about the past, projecting into the future, we're actually missing life in the only place that exists. And you, I'm sure you know this from having a beautiful little daughter. Um, kids can be, you know, it's innate in them to be present. And they really kind of hold a mirror up to us when we're not. They really, uh, they, they feel our energy and they know when we're not with them and they really um they really start acting out when we're not with them and it's kind of like a wake-up call come back dad i'm here <laughs> I, I think you, you, you probably uh i just think you hit the nerve with a lot of parents especially the ones that had to work from home and have kids as well I, I know a few of my clients and friends that have really struggled to you know be present with a kid as well as trying to work which is impossible and kid kind of basically calling them out for not playing or doing whatever so that's a very good point it's really one of the things that i noticed um a dramatic shift in me when i first started meditating was i came to the realization that i was never properly 100 percent present in either space which actually essentially means you're not present anywhere 
Mm. So if, if you're experiencing that when you're with your kids, if you really stop and look, you'll realize that you're experiencing it at work, you're experiencing it when you're out surfing, you're experiencing it when you're hanging out with family, friends, because, you know, what you're seeing in one space, you'll notice is, is across the board. And so the, the problem, there's a number of problems that come with that, right? If we're, if we're constantly drifting away from present moment awareness, you know, it, it, obviously with our kids, it's very clear what the problem is. We're missing this, this we're, we're missing the opportunity to be with them and to be with them in love and, and really connecting. And we're not actually working. Our mind is thinking about work, but we're getting nothing done. So actually we're just missing everything. We're yeah. totally missing everything. And then, you know, you, you're at work and you're thinking you'd rather be out in the surf, but you're not even working efficiently. Then you're out in the surf and you start thinking about work and so you, you're not present when a wave comes and you miss that opportunity. And so we're just missing everything. When we come into present moment awareness, we start to, there's actually a very deep piece that comes with present moment awareness. There's not really problems in the present moment. In the present moment, if a problem arises, we can deal with it. If a problem arises in our mind, it's a massive problem because we can't deal with it. It's a, it's a total creation of the mind. It's projected you know, into some sort of worry about the future. You can't deal with it now. This is not to say that we don't look at the future. I mean, if we can look at the future and plan for the future, but you can only ever do that in the present moment as well. And you can only do, ever do that to the degree in which you're able to be present. So when we, when we, um, to illustrate what I'm talking about, you know, have you ever had an experience where you're driving home from the city, say, and you, you know, I've had experience with driving back from the city to Avalon and I get home and I think I can't even remember driving. Mm. Yeah. I used it's to get common. that, um, training for water polo. I used to, uh, I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably was more asleep than anything, but, uh, coming back <laughs> home and go like, Oh, I don't remember driving to training. So yeah. And so, so the interesting phenomenon with that is that you actually drove safely. No problem. You didn't run any red lights. You didn't run anyone over. You didn't crash your car. This is the subconscious mind. The program, when we first learned to drive, you know, particularly if you're driving a manual, but for any of us, it was difficult. You had to think about it. You know, you're putting the clutch in, changing gears, everything, lots of kind of conscious awareness. Over time, that program became subconscious. We're able to, we're able to do it without thinking. Then suddenly you can drive while you know, having a chat on, on your, hopefully your hands-free phone. Um, you know, you could be listening to a podcast. There could be someone in the car, you're chatting to them. All of this stuff kind of happening simultaneously, no problem when you're driving and you're not even thinking about it. So that's, I guess, one advantage of the subconscious mind and its power through its programs. But what we need to realize is, is if we're having that experience driving home, then we're probably having that experience, like I said, when we're with our kids, when we're with our colleagues, with our loved ones, when we're out exercising, surfing, whatever, we've got this tendency with our mind to drift out of the present. What happens? Who's running the show when we're out of the present? Well, our subconscious mind's running the show. And the problem with that is, is much of the programming is faulty. So like Bruce Lipton um, describes it in the biology, it's a really wonderful book called The Biology of Belief. Um, he describes it as the faulty software running your computer. There's no one in the subconscious mind. You can't talk to your subconscious mind. It's literally just like a record and playback system or software that runs our mind. Now, if we've got faulty software, we've got a narrative that's steering our life, that's building our sense of self and our place in the world that's potentially very faulty basically cut, developed between mostly between zero and five, but all the way through to 12. Zip between around about two and five, children are in what's known as theta consciousness. Theta consciousness is basically like hypnosis. That's what the state we get into in hypnosis. So children are basically being hypnotized by society, culture, parents, all these things, and they're taking on, this is how kids take on so much information so quickly. They learn, you know, from zero to five, we've learned a language, we're able to walk, run around, all these things. We've learned our, a sense of place in our, in our family, in our community culture. Um, all of these things just happen so rapidly and it's basically being implanted into our subconscious mind. But <laughs> without awareness of what those stories are, we can have a narrative, a very self-limiting idea of who and what we are running our whole system. Every time your mind drifts out of present moment awareness, that's what's running the show. 
you know, if you've got faulty software, then, you know, you've got this dialogue that's going on and it's usually you're not even aware of it, but this dialogue going on for many people that's telling them they're not good enough, they're not worthy, I could never do that. Um, I want to I wanna step into this role, but I'm not good enough, but that's for someone else. When we come into, well, through the practice of meditation, when we start to develop present moment awareness, we start to really start to witness the narrative that's playing in our mind and to really override a lot of our faulty software. Uh, that's awesome. I really love this. Um, and, you know, if I look at it, the best athletes in the world, the best, you know, successful, most successful business people in the world that are healthy, um, they all meditate. Um, but yet, for a lot of us, meditation is so hard to get into. So why do you reckon... Um, that is, and also like, I mean, what would be some tips to get into it? Like, what you know, how can we get into meditation as soon as possible? Yeah, so the reason people think that meditation is difficult to do is because they haven't been trained. They haven't got it, uh, they haven't been trained correctly. And so there's a lot of misnomers around meditation. One of them, the main ones being that meditation is a silent a silent mind so people sit down and they've got this idea that they need to control the mind and they need to create silence the very act the very thought don't think is a thought so as soon as you sit down with that attitude to meditate with no training and you just think okay focus on the breath sit down focus on the breath don't think don't think oh, i'm thinking and then i'm no good at this i knew i wouldn't be able to do this my mind's too busy more thoughts more thoughts more thoughts more thoughts when the 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 most widely used and the most ancient kind of original and widely used meditation technique out of the Yoga Vedantic tradition is a mantra-based technique. Um, as I said earlier, mantra, the word mantra means mind vehicle or heart vehicle. So it's a, it's a sound that we once, you know, initiated into a practice and you get this personal sound that has a vibrational nature that you just think the sound effortlessly and it allows the mind, each time you think that sound, effortlessly the mantra just has this tendency to become softer and quieter and to actually draw the mind inward so in the technique that i teach we don't try to meditate we just sit down and we think this sound effortlessly we don't have any intention of controlling the mind whatsoever and we start to really just simply and effortlessly and innocently dive beyond the surface level it's when you trying to meditate with control like focus techniques where you're you're focusing on a particular aspect, usually your breath, are very challenging because you're using the mind to try to control the mind. And so a lot of people's sort of entry point into meditation is, is um, you know, at the end of a yoga class, focus on your breath or mindfulness where they might say, focus on your breath like your life depends on it. This can be very challenging for someone who hasn't done any mental training. But when you learn an effortless technique, you realize, Thoughts are not the enemy of meditation. Thoughts can coexist within meditation. We're actually just effortlessly diving beyond the surface where it naturally becomes quieter. Anyone can do it. With the right training, anyone can do it. No, that's that's cool. Um, so you're saying we need a coach, basically. Like uh, if I was going to learn to play tennis, I should get a coach. If I was going to learn to um, learn to surf, I should get a coach. And you're saying that if I want to learn to meditate, I should probably get a teacher. Yeah, I think ultimately a teacher is a very useful thing, for mm. sure. You know, and even as a teacher, I still have a teacher. No, totally. It's part of the, the tradition of the, you know, part of the, the tradition that these practices come from is you have a teacher. Yeah. Now, you don't need a teacher, but it's always, I mean, why, if, if someone else has already kind of gone along that path and already has a degree of mastery and can help you attain that degree of mastery, why would you try to develop it yourself? Yeah. Well, you know, but there's no point going and kind of trying to cut, getting a machete and cut your way through the forest when there's a well-worn path. Now, the path to, to wellness, you know, as you know, is, is very unique and different for everyone, but there's certain certain features that I think are good for everyone. And like I said before, you know, one of the main reasons you would meditate, I would say, is because your whole experience of life is actually an experience in consciousness. This is not some sort of esoteric idea. This is the truth. Every experience you have is filtered through your state of mind. Now, you walk around in, in rose glasses, the whole world looks rose, right? You, everything you look at looks rose. You've got no, 
you are unable to distinguish, you're not able to pick up the greens in the trees or the grass, you're just seeing red. You're not even able to pick up particular nuances in the red, you're just seeing a particular kind of colour of red. Now, if we're walking around angry, then that's what we experience. Yeah, for sure. Life kind of is like a feedback system. If we're angry, we just get anger back at us. If we're depressed, you know, you look at someone in depression, from the outside, it may not make sense. You can look at friends or someone, friend or family, and, and think, you know, they've got a really good life. You know, they, they, they've got a beautiful family. They're financially independent. They've got a job that they like. But for whatever reason, they slip into that state of depression. From that state, the only experience they can have while they're in that dark hole is depression. Every experience. You walk out on a sunny day down the beach, there's, there's you know, the, the water's sparkling and beautiful offshore winds at the crisp autumn morning, still depressed. You know, that's the state of mind. Now, if you've got a, a practice like meditation that fundamentally alters your state of mind, that uplifts your state of mind, that uplifts your experience of life, why would you not do that as a foundation? And it's simple. You don't need a teacher. You can start with an app. You can start, you know, Googling and looking online. But ultimately, I think for most people, they're going to come to a point where a teacher can be really useful because an app can't really guide you in your the nuances of your subtle experience. Everyone's experience as we move into these kind of these evolutionary practices, everyone's experiences is different. And so it, for me anyway, it was incredibly helpful it has been and still is incredibly helpful to have a teacher to guide me for sure no, that makes sense um speaking of apps uh, i know we just said we need a teacher but any particular apps that are kind of a good starter that you would think it's uh uh i i couldn't really recommend any because i've never gone down the path to be honest i you know i learned from a teacher straight away so i never had the need to go and look at an app um but i'm sure you know i i think things like headspace um you know, I'm sure there's things out there that you can just dip your toes into. Yeah. Um, we're actually going to be releasing a, a beginner's um, meditation mindfulness breath work thing through the Stuff for Life soon as well. Um, there's many ways to dip your toes into it. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, learning learning a practice and learning how to do it properly is, is very beneficial for sure. I'll put stuff in a show notes. Um, now, a few years ago, uh, I went for a surf trip to Mentawi's and I was pretty excited. It was my first trip uh, surfing the reef and my biggest fear was getting smashed in the reef. And I think it might have been you before the trip, you said, oh, potentially work on your breath work. And I was like, whatever, what would Marcus know? And it wasn't until I had my first wipeout and I got held underwater for what felt like six minutes, even though it's probably 10 seconds. And it was the first time kind of came to my attention the whole breath work and I remember I was talking to a few guys on a boat about it and and then fast forward a few years uh, on, uh, you and I worked with um, one of the water polo teams and you um, introduced them to breath work, um, mm-hmm. box breathing is from my memory. Um, what what can you tell us about that? I know you're a surfer and I know um, you, you, you surf some pretty big waves, a bit bigger waves than mine, but um, breath work, what can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, so I would say that when we look at the whole system of of yoga, breath is a foundation, right? It's a foundation. Like, well, meditation is a foundation, but breath is a very integral part. Um, and you know, from you know what you teach as well, that breath is a kind of primary aspect of our health. When we learn to breathe properly, we can totally change the state of our health. I would also add that. The breath and the mind flow together. This is a very clear thing that you discover when you when you start going deeper into meditation and breath work. Where, if we consider, you know, back where I started with anxiety, under a, in a stressed response, what you'll notice is the human body starts to uh, shallow breathe, starts to breathe in this very kind of quick <laughs> this sort of way. Now, when we're breathing like that we're actually creating a feedback loop where we're telling the mind that we're stressed and then the mind is telling the body that we're stressed and then we continue to breathe like that until we stay in this, this kind of feedback loop of stress. Pe- many people are shallow breathing all the time. In fact, it's the normal. I'm sure you see it with your clients. It's one of the most normal things. You know, When I first start working with people, 
and teach them to meditate. I'm always looking at how they breathe. Just and I can see the vast majority of people breathe in the upper parts of their lungs. Um, so to begin with, what we need to train is just simple, simply how to diaphragmatically breathe. It's the simplest thing. When we learn to initiate the breath from the diaphragm, when the diaphragm becomes the primary muscle for initiating the breath, what happens is then we draw air down into our belly, which gets down into our lower lungs. When we get to the lower lobes of the lungs, we're actually the capacity of oxygen is greater through the lower lobes of the lungs. And then, you know, the body becomes more oxygenated, more balanced. The, actually, the, the, if you look at the heart, the heart sits in a bag called the pericardium. The pericardium is actually attached to the diaphragm. When we breathe in diaphragmatically, the pericardium stretches out. It elongates the heart, helps to draw blood up into the heart. When we breathe out diaphragmatically, the diaphragm lifts, squeezes the pericardium, squeezes the heart, helps blood, pump blood out. So the diaphragm, when we're breathing correctly, actually becomes a second pump for the heart as well. It takes pressure off the heart, helps to regulate the rhythm of the heart. The heart, with every beat, as you know, is sending messages through the body, whether the body's in coherence or in lack of coherence. Um, so even just learning to breathe in that diaphragmatic way, we're instantly telling the body that the body's calm. We're sending messages to the brain that the, that the mind's calm and we get in this feedback loop of, of being calm uh, so yeah that's not that's really just your foundation and then when it comes to surfing I mean there's many other breath breath is like I kind of look at breath like playing the drums you know if you just if someone just says they can play the drums and then they just come and play one rhythm with a band it's not going to work right and so the breath is the same we've got different through what we call pranayama pranayama prana, prana it means life force it doesn't just mean breath, it means life force, but the access to life force is through the breath. And so through pranayama practices, there's, very, there's many, many different practices that we use in different particular kind of signatures and time rhythms and different ways of breathing that we use for activating different aspects of our prana, our life force. When it comes to you know surfing, if you're looking at increasing your breath hold, then you know, you need, what you're really primarily doing is trying to get the body used to carbon dioxide because what's happening when we're being held underwater we're not in oxygen depth so much as we're in we're over carbon dioxide and we and that makes us feel like we're desperate for air that's why when you've been under for six seconds it feels like you've been under for a minute yeah well i got two questions one selfish about surfing and one's yep. hopefully relates to it um do you do breath work exercises before you surf uh, big waves. Now, for the audience, um, Marcus surfs some stupidly big waves, and I'll put a picture on um, on um, on, a, on a show notes. But obviously, you had some white person in your time and your held downs. But would you do breath work before you go out? Yeah, always. Um, yes, definitely. So I do. What I would, I mean, I guess like anything, there's there's what you're doing daily. And then there's what you do prior to the, you know, like if we're looking at another form of athletes, they're doing all their training and then they're, you know, stretching and warming up before an event. So I do both. I would do breath work is very much a part of my daily routine. Um, I do a lot of breath work that I would say is kind of quite similar to Wim Hof. So it's a lot of, we call it in Sapa Yoga, it's called cosmic breath. Very similar, slightly more, I guess, subtle, sophisticated way of doing what Wim Hof does, but very similar practice. So essentially increasing the body's capacity to deal with holding your breath for longer periods of time and also on empty lung holds, increasing the capacity to deal with carbon dioxide um, to stay calm in a breathless state. I do a lot of that and a lot of practices to just build the diaphragm, build strength in the diaphragm because the diaphragm is a muscle. Um, and then prior to surfing, I would always do warm-up stuff, so stuff that warms up the diaphragm and then breath holds, I do a lot of... Um, I would start with empty lung breath holds, getting used to cut that um, carbon dioxide feeling, and then full lung breath holds. And I usually um, would do some Wim Hof style breathing, some cosmic breath stuff before I go out as well. Um, and then I find, you know, as you would know from, from coaching athletes, different athletes operate at different levels. So some people are going to operate better in a very heightened state. But for me, um, if I'm approaching waves that are, pushing my comfort zone, I, I need to calm down, not get more ex 
excited. I'm already, you know, anxious in those situations. So then I'll do, I'll use the breath also, not just prior to surfing, but when I'm out there, I'm constantly coming back to breath and breathing diaphragmatically um, while I'm out there to stay calm and to help regulate and also to help oxygenate so that if I do wipe out, I'm, I'm, the body is already full of oxygen. Um, um, so, yeah, multiple aspects to it. Well, no, you, you, you just did an awesome job of leading into it because my question was, do you get scared in the big waves? And it sounds like obviously there's a bit of anxiety. And where I was going with this is um, there's going to be a lot of people facing a bit of fear, um, whether they're losing their job, having to get a new job or whatever. Um, and, yeah, like I, I think it's, you just basically kind of answered it. Like, you know, if you're facing – or would you recommend if you're facing, you know, a bad interview, a job interview, whatever – would you basically go to a similar routine on what you just said? Like, you know, calm yourself down, breath work, using the technique you learn from meditation, or is there any particular techniques you would recommend? Yeah, so I would say that ultimately it would be very good if you're already meditating. Um, the whole system that I teach is really, it's more about prevention than, than cure. You know, it's sort of like Eastern medicine as well is that they work with curing and we can use these practices to help us once we're in that state but the idea would be to do the practice so you're not in that state so that you're feeling calm centered balanced all the time but that doesn't mean that we don't be, get put in situations that challenge us like everyone has i guess a boundary of where we feel secure and, and when we step over that where we're facing some fear i'd say that when you've got a solid meditation practice you start to become more and more comfortable with stepping into fear, stepping into the unknown. It starts to become an area that you play with a lot more, pushing boundaries. And that's what I'm I actually, if it comes to surfing, that's why I like putting myself in there. And, you know, to be clear, this is all very relative. Like if you ask a big wave surfer, the situations like I put myself in, they, it's just a walk in the park for them. But, you know, we're talking about putting ourselves in a situation that's uncomfortable for us, whatever that is. It could be five foot or it could be 10 foot or it could be 20 foot. It doesn't matter what the situation is, but where you, where the comfort zone is, once you've got a practice like this, you become more and more comfortable with pushing those boundaries. And that extends into your life, right? Like starting, starting new projects that, you know, in the past you might have put off because you didn't want to put yourself out there, um, you know, going for that new job, quitting the job that you, that you despise, you know, realising that this life is, is, a, is a miracle and, and that I'm blessed to be alive and that it's a short period of time and that, you know, I actually want to do what I want to do and maybe taking that leap to actually follow your purpose and your passion. Whatever it is, there's going to be discomfort. It's part of the human experience that when it's the irony of life, right? Like the only thing that's ever going on is change but we're terrified of change. Mm. The pain that comes from change, I think, comes from the, to, to the degree in which we cling to the past. So whenever we're clinging to something that's changing and trying to keep it the same, that's where, that's where our discomfort comes from. So when we learn to kind of let go of things as they naturally change and step into the new, then we become more and more comfortable in that space. Oh, that's what I think is wonderful about sport, surfing, other sports, is that we're in this sort of environment, we're testing ourselves it's kind of bringing out a bit more of that warrior in us that we don't get to do in everyday life. Um, but it extends, hopefully, everything we learn in these environments extend into our life. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth doing it. You know, like if you're playing elite sport or you're surfing or whatever, all the lessons that we're learning from that hopefully extend into our life. That's the point of doing it, from my, at least from my perspective. Um, so if you've got a, a solid foundation practice, then your breath work also as a solid practice, then what happens is you can use the breath in the day as a waking state practice. It's your kind of key mindfulness practice to bring you back to self-awareness. To Well, to use self-awareness ultimately to self-regulate. So if we put this whole thing in the framework of emotional intelligence, the foundation of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. The meditation practice really builds self-awareness and the breath work does as well. And then, but from that, if we're not, practicing self-regulation, the self-awareness is kind of useless. Yeah, I'm aware that I'm acting like an arsehole, but I'm still acting like an arsehole. So the next step is self-regulation, and that's where the breath can be really useful. Okay, I'm going into a job interview. Oh, I'm feeling really anxious. My, a really useful tip, I think, in that instance is how we frame that as well. If we say, I am feeling really anxious, 
it's actually become existential. You've created a state where your whole sense of self is defined by this fleeting emotion of anxiousness. If we can even just define that as being my body feels anxious, we're creating a gap where we're able to, from a deeper state, observe, this, have awareness around the fact that my body feels this. Now that I say my body is feeling you know, worried, scared, anxious, whatever, now I can start to think, okay, how can I regulate it? And the immediate way to regulate it is through the breath. So just realizing, you, you tune in, you'll notice that you're breathing shallow, shallow breath. So then you come to, okay, I need to override that shallow breath. The beautiful thing about the breath, right, it's autonomic, meaning that it's part of our autonomic nervous system. It happens without us, just all day long, without us having awareness on it. But when we bring awareness to it, it's the one part of the nervous, autonomic nervous system that the average human being can control. We know from Wim Hof and other advanced yogis, they can control all of it ultimately. But for the average human being, we can control the breath. So just coming back to simple awareness along, around the breath, starting to, and to engage the diaphragm to breathe into the belly. There's three aspects to the way we breathe if we want to calm down. There's, there's breathing deeply. And when I say deeply, it just means using your diaphragm, breathing into your belly. So you should feel your belly expand first before your chest. And then as you breathe out, you should feel your belly contract first and then your chest. A good way of learning how to do that is just to close your eyes and put a hand on your belly and a hand on your chest and start to tune into that. Then there's breathing smoothly. So you don't want your breath to be steppy. You want it to have that quality of kind of um, feeling very smooth. And then the rhythm. So the particular time signature, so it can help to start to count. So breathe in for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four. If you're doing it formally um, at home with your eyes closed or in your office or whatever, your eyes closed, you can do three-part breathing as well, where you breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four. But, you know, with our eyes open just in daily life, we can just bring our awareness to our breath. But if we can keep the rhythm, the time signature steady, keep it smooth and breathe deeply, you'll find that almost immediately your nervous system starts to calm down. As your nervous system starts to calm down, because as what I said before, that your breath and your mind flow together, as your nervous system starts to calm, then you'll find your mind starts to calm as well. Then you come into present moment awareness and you can step into what it, whatever you're doing from that calmer state. No, that's, um, that's awesome, Marcus. And um, I think I mentioned this part before, but um, a, a lot of people that, you know, like that they, they eat under stress, um, under, under, under stress and the digestive system doesn't work as well. So doing like a minute, two minutes of those breathing they just described you can do so much more for their well-being, not just from calming down, but also how everything else works and therefore sleep better and everything else. So now it's really good info. Uh, the, 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 food thing, the food thing is fascinating because people, are, are so, so many people are so obsessed with what they eat and so extreme about it that they're actually creating stress and then eating under stress. And it doesn't matter how good, whatever you think is good food, whether it's, you know, vegan, vegetarian, paleo, whatever your take on it is, this, and this comes back to what I was saying before, if you're forgetting the foundation, you're forgetting the state of your mind, then, you know, you can be eating the best food in the world um, biodynamic, organic food and everything, and, and you're just turning it into poison. You're not digesting it. And then that that creates toxins in the body. Um, so our state of mind, yeah, the way we approach our food, eating with love, taking our time, not being distracted, not being on devices while we're eating. Um, and like you said, doing some breathing before we eat can be really good as well. Well, I've seen even some of my clients in the past that um, they eat all the best food, but they're still inflamed. And it's because they're so high stress. They've got a lot, a lot of anxiety going on. Um, Marcus, thank you very much for your time. Now, before we leave, um, people want to get into it. Uh, where can they find you? What are you doing now? Obviously, you had to kind of maybe tweak your business a bit as well. Like, um, where can we uh, find you? Yeah, so I mean, I'm back. I'm back running Vedic courses now, small courses. Um, you know, we can have we can have a few people in our studio, so they're happening. I teach in Avalon um, twice a month. That's um, four 90-minute sessions, um, get yourself sufficient in the practice. I've also been teaching Sattva Meditation online, and that I'll be doing those once a month. Um, we, I teach privately as well. I do a lot of mentoring, coaching, things like that. We've got an intro meditation, mindfulness, breathwork course, which I mentioned earlier. That'll be 
hopefully online soon. We've just been really busy trying to get that. We've shot it all. It's all edited. It just needs to get it up. Um, you can find us um, on Instagram at the Sup for Life, S-A-T-T-V-A Life. Um, with actually dots in between the dots, the dot life. Um, you can share that in your mm-hmm. show notes. Um, Facebook's the same. Um, website, www.thesupforlife.com. Yeah, you can just reach out. Mate, I'll put it on show notes and looking forward to seeing the online stuff as well. And, um, yeah, thanks very much. No worries. Absolute pleasure, man.